Lab everybody. On the bench today we have a ham radio repair. Many of you have been asking why aren't you fixing ham stuff anymore Terry? We miss it. Okay guys here it is and this is probably one of the most difficult repairs that you'll ever run across on a ham receiver. This is a National 300. It was bought off of eBay and it was guaranteed to work but the guy didn't guarantee that it worked on all the bands. So a friend of mine got the receiver, he hooked it up, and the one band that he wanted to use was dead. So he brought it over to the shop, I opened it up, and I was like, oh boy, somebody didn't use a dial key, and they keyed a transmitter direct into the front end of this receiver and smoked it. So my task is to get in there and attempt a repair. I think I have a plan. It's not going to be the prettiest thing in the world, but I believe it'll work. Let me show you what's going on. All right, here is the bottom of the NC300. This is the RF cavity. So your band select switch goes all the way through here. You see that shaft? That shaft comes from the front of the radio where it has mechanical coupling. He goes through all these wafer sections in the different compartments. This section is the RF input section, and that's the one that took a hit. Let me close up on it. So it's going to be pretty difficult for me to show you guys the details. It's very congested in here. You can see all the coils, the wafer sections, etc. But if you take a look at this coil, you can see somebody had attempted a repair and then if you look back behind the coil you see the wafer section it's all black and charred as a matter of fact one of the contacts of the wafer switch is damaged it blew right off of the little phenolic plate so there's really no way to repair this in the radio so my task is to figure out how to get that section of the band switch out without having to totally disassemble the NC300. Because if you look at this RF cavity, it's made by this aluminum construction, right? And there's a bunch of screws and bolts and these sections are all tied together and there's things going through. There's a lot of things wired in from the top. So attempting a regular repair at this point wouldn't be feasible. He didn't pay that much for the receiver so I have to find an economical solution I believe I have found it and I know a lot of you guys are going to be like oh my god I can't believe he's doing that but you know what guys I'm going to turn a 12 hour job into a 2 hour job let me show you what I'm thinking so if you take a look at the RF input section there's three little wafer plates and of course the coils and then there's those screws here with some spacers and it's actually screwed to this aluminum plate. There's some nuts on the other side that you can remove and all of this section will actually try to slide off of the inner shaft. Okay, So I had an, another uh, NC300 in my garage and I thought okay I'm gonna try it and here it is. I removed this section by actually cutting that shaft and I was able to pull it straight out. But obviously I can't do that on this receiver because I can't cut that shaft, can I? But what I can do, if we swing over this way a little bit, I can actually make an access point by removing some of this aluminum. So what my plan is, I'm gonna take my Dremel tool, I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna cut across here and here. I'm going to take some tin snips. I'm going to come down this way vertically and remove two of the aluminum plates, which will give me access to this band select switch. I'll be able to take out the screws, pull this off, slide in my new section, wire it up, and then I'll just install a new piece of aluminum for the structural and RF integrity that the original receiver had. Okay, so hate on me if you want to, but this is the most economical solution that I could come up with. The guy already paid too much for the receiver. It's been sitting here almost a year. And I've been contemplating how can I do this 
and make this guy happy, you know, and not charge him a million bucks, right? And also not burn up a bunch of my time. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to get in here and do the chop chop, get the new band select section installed, and test the receiver. All right, here's the tools for the job. I got a Dremel tool with a cutoff wheel. I'm going to be able to come down here and score it. There's the original antenna leads. I pulled the audio output transformer back to gain access so I wouldn't damage anything. Then, take the old tin snips and we cut down vertically, remove the plates. Also see on these yellow wires coming from the antenna terminals, there's arc marks down there and the back side of the wafer switch is also damaged. This thing really got hit with some high power. Alright, I got the cut done across the bottom. Now, I'm going to get my tin snips in here and cut vertically and remove the plates. So the vertical cutting wasn't too bad at all. Now I just got to work these plates out of here without uh, causing any other damage. Then, when I'm all done, I'll straighten this out and put a new piece of aluminum across the back. All right, there she is. I have full access now to sliding out this section of the wafer, just a few wires to take off. I'll have the new piece in in no time. All right, I've got the hardware off of the nose of this guy, and she is sliding back. At this point, though, I really got to watch what I'm doing, so I'll cut back after this assembly's off, and the new one is slid into place. Okay, progress report. I had the new RF input wafer switches slid on the shaft. I had to push the audio output transformer back a little bit more to clear the old assembly coming off. But it went right on. Now I'm going to transfer the wiring over. Now that I have this out and inspecting it closer, I see some arcing here, some arcing here, and everything down here looks pretty baked. So this poor guy really took a hit. It's a good thing I had the spare. All right, let's get it wired. All right, mission complete. I ensured that the band select positions are correct. Everything's wired up. I don't see anything that could cause a problem, so it's time to power it up and see how it receives. All right, I got the new switch installed. Everything looks good. Now I'm going to buzz out the input coils. You can do this by connecting an ohm meter to the antenna input jack and ground. And as you turn the band switch, you're going to see each one of these input coils switch in, which is low resistance, okay? I had one or two with the old one that were open. So we'll start out at the 160 meter band, and I'm just going to roll the band switch. You'll see the resistance deflect a little bit, but it's usually a very low level resistance, like under 2 ohms, okay? So you see 1.62, there's 80, 40, 20, 15, 11 meter, and 10 meters. So you can see all of our input RF coils are present. So this did fix the RF input section of the band selector switch. Okay, the NC300 is up and running and ready to put on an antenna for a real test. I installed that rear aluminum plate for the area that I had to cut out. Also put in a new set of filter capacitors. Anytime you're working on these receivers, guys, whether that thing is operating fine or not, put in some fresh caps, okay? It's 60 years old, good preventative maintenance. All right, now I'm going to show you guys the HFO operation and we'll run the calibrator on each band to make sure they're receiving. Okay, I use this little trick when I'm wondering if the high frequency oscillator is running for each band. Sometimes you have a dead band on one of these receivers and you really won't know where to start, okay? So initially, if you have white noise, you know that your IF stages are working and sometimes if you touch the antenna terminal, it will appear as though it is receiving, but it's not without the HFO doing its job. 
Okay, so here's the easy way to do it. I just take an oscilloscope probe and I just pop it in the cavity by the 6AH5 or 6AH6 oscillator tube in this first cavity. Okay, then I swing over to my scope and if you take a look, you'll see a sine wave on the scope. Okay, it is seeing that band which currently, I'm having to walk around in circles here because my camera is right in the way. I'm trying to get to the controls. Okay. So I'm on 20 meter band. There's 15. There's 11. Okay. And then if you were to take your time, stretch that out, as you're adjusting the tuning knob, you would see that sine wave moving, okay? So that is the tuning operation of the NC300 main tuning capacitor. So this is an easy way to detect if you have oscillator excitation in each band without physically connecting the scope to any component. All right, to verify that each band can receive and has adequate gain, I've installed an XCU300 calibrator module. So we will go to the front of the receiver and check the calibrator. It's a good way to know if your bands are alive and well. Let's start off up here on a 10 meter band. Turn on the calibrator. There's 10 meter. Let's go to 11. Oh yeah. So these upper bands don't have the same gain as the lowers, but look at look at 11 meters. She's just booming. Next band. Same deal. Use your antenna trimmer. Mega gain. All right. Yeah. This thing is really working well. 40 meter, which is one of my favorites for CW. Look at that, it just pegs the needle. Yeah, oh yeah. So all the bands <clears throat> are working just fine. Okay, it's time to hook up an antenna and put this NC300 back on the air. All right, well there's your ham radio fix from D-Lab Electronics. Every year when I'm off on Christmas break, I always try to fix a ham radio or two because yes I also get a little bit tired of fixing guitar amps okay so these are a lot of fun they present a new challenge hopefully during this video you picked up some good tips these NC 300s are by far my favorite AM receiver that's what I use on my station so we'll see you next year right here on YouTube and if you want to work me on CW I hang out on 7.115 megahertz CW operating boat anchors.